Hello there, my dear viewers. Happy New Year. I wish you all a very happy, healthy, and most importantly, peaceful 2023. Today we're going to talk about the very famous New Year's dish for many Eastern Europeans, Salat Olivier. But first, a little housekeeping. It came to my attention that many of my subscribers don't realize that clicking the subscribe button doesn't do much. If you want YouTube to put my new videos in your feed, you have to click the bell button. Okay, now you know. And as John Oliver says, on to our main topic tonight. If you are from Russia or Ukraine or Belarus or Georgia or any of the former Soviet Union republics, your New Year's Eve table will almost certainly include Salat Olivier. In case you didn't know that already, I grew up in the former Soviet Union. And let me tell you something, most of the Soviet cuisine didn't exactly capture the imagination of other countries. But Salat Olivier is an exception. In the rest of the world, it's known as the Russian salad. I've seen it in France and Italy and Spain and all over Europe. There are two reasons for this salad's popularity. The first is that it predates the Soviet Union, so it probably became popular in Europe before all the cultural exchange between Russia and the West stopped. And the second reason is that it's a really great potato salad with a beautiful harmony of flavors and textures. The ingredients that are unique to this salad, besides the potatoes, are carrots, peas, pickles, and some form of meat. I'm not going to go over the very complicated history of Olivier because I can't possibly do a better job than Arseni from My Name is Andong. You can check out his video here and I'll link it below. He is one of my favorite culinary YouTube creators and that particular video is really entertaining. The goal of my video is to show you how I make Olivier. As always, it's not authentic, it's better. One of my viewers suggested that I put that on a t-shirt. Hmm, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> anyway, all the ingredient amounts for this dish are completely flexible, so feel free to eyeball and ignore my measurements. The pickle type is a big deal. It needs to be a dill pickle. I want the flavors of dill and garlic and I want the pickles to be salty and sour and not sweet and sour. The size doesn't matter. The only ones my store had this time were small but big would work as well. I like to peel my pickles since the skin can be chewy and unpleasant and then dice them really finely. Now we need an onion. Yellow onion would be ridiculously aggressive. Red onion would be better. And white onion is my first choice because of its mildness. Olivier is best made ahead and you don't want an onion that will get smelly. Put the pickles and onions into a large bowl and add one tablespoon of pickle brine. Now let's talk about my very unusual way of cooking potatoes and carrots. The potato type I'm using is Yukon Gold. If you are not in the US, look for waxy or boiling potatoes. Traditionally, potatoes and carrots are boiled whole in their skins, then peeled and chopped after cooking. You're welcome to do that, but I have a feeling that there are two reasons why it was done this way. Before peelers were invented, people peeled potatoes with a little paring knife, which was hard and resulted in some waste. So it was a lot easier and more economical to do it after cooking. But now that we have peelers, I find it easier to peel the veggies before I cook them. The second reason I suspect has to do with knife sharpness and knife skills. It was never all that great for most home cooks. If you're chopping potatoes and carrots with a dull knife, it's definitely easier after cooking. But after cooking, they tend to be very sticky and gluey. So I find it easier to chop them before cooking, assuming you have a sharp knife and decent knife skills. Besides the practical reasons, there is also a taste reason why I first chop and then cook potatoes and carrots. This lets me produce potatoes that are less sticky. Some starch comes out of them during cooking and the resulting salad feels a bit less glued together. I like that, but as Adam Ragusia says, you do you. 
cut the carrots into three to four inch lengths. Cut off about a quarter inch on one side. Set the carrot on the flat surface that you just created and slice into planks. Put the planks flat side down on the board and cut into sticks. Turn the sticks around and divide into manageable piles. Then cut into dice so that you end up with a quarter inch dice. It's important to keep the carrots much smaller than potatoes since we are cooking them together and the carrots cook slower. The carrots should definitely end up firmer than potatoes, but we don't want them rock hard. To dice potatoes, cut off this side and this side and set aside. Since potatoes are sticky, it's better to use the tip of the knife than the back of the knife to reduce stickiness. Slice potatoes into boards. Tilt potatoes onto the other flat side you just created and repeat the slicing step. I like to apply pressure to the top of the potatoes to keep the slices from falling apart when I pull the knife out. Rotate potatoes the other way and cut into dice. You should end up with roughly a half inch dice. Remember those sides that we removed? Let's dice them up too. Put the potatoes and carrots into a pot. Cover with cold water and season with salt. This is where I realized that I needed a bit more water so that I can fit the eggs into the same pot too. Set the pot over high heat cover and bring to a boil. While the pot is coming to a boil, weigh two eggs separately, not together. A carton that says large can easily have an egg that's 54 grams and an egg that's 64 grams, and they'll need different cooking time. Today my eggs are 63 and 64 grams, so they'll need 11 minutes of cooking, assuming you keep your eggs in the fridge. Once the veggies are boiling, Uncover, add the eggs and set the timer for the right amount of time for your eggs. Turn down the heat so that the pot is simmering very gently and cook uncovered. Prepare a little bowl of ice water for the eggs. Once the time is up, remove the eggs to chill. This is a good time to taste the potatoes. They usually take about 12 minutes for me. You want your potatoes just tender but not falling apart. Be careful not to overcook them. It's especially important if you are using Yukon Golds. They have the best flavor but can fall apart with the slightest overcooking. Don't worry about the carrots. They have a much wider range of perfectly delicious textures. So if the potatoes are done, you're done. Immediately take the pot off heat. Pour in one cup of frozen peas. I like the little ones sold under their French name of petit pois. Let them sit for 30 seconds and drain in a colander. Do not rinse. Spread the veggies out on a paper towel lined baking sheet to absorb the remaining water and help them cool faster. This is really important. Don't just let them sit in the colander and get soggy. If you really don't want to wash a baking sheet, you can lay out a piece of foil and paper towel on your counter and then toss the foil when the veggies are cool. You can cook your salmon any which way you want. My preferred way is to broil it with a sweet, sour and salty glaze. Preheat the oven to 350 degrees. Combine one tablespoon of apricot preserve, one and a half teaspoons of balsamic vinegar and one tablespoon of soy sauce in a small bowl. Mix to combine. It's okay if you have a few chunks of apricot remaining. Put one pound of salmon fillet onto a metal baking sheet. Make sure your salmon has the skin on it to insulate it from the direct heat of the pan. If you want the cleanup to be easy, wrap the baking sheet in foil. Sprinkle very lightly with salt. Use about half of what you think the salmon needs since we are using soy sauce. Spoon just enough glaze over salmon to cover the top, but be careful that the glaze doesn't pull around salmon since it will burn under the broiler. Turn on the broiling element. My top rack doesn't come close enough to the broiler, so I use an inverted baking sheet as a riser. 
put the pan with salmon under the broiler and cook until the top browns. This will take three to five minutes, depending on your broiler. If parts of salmon are burning before the rest browns, cover them with foil. Once your salmon is brown, remove it from the oven and reset the oven to 350 degrees. If you were using a baking sheet riser, get it out. Pour the remaining glaze over the salmon and put it in the bottom third of the oven until it's just done. How long this will take depends on the thickness of your salmon. Start checking it when the total cooking time broiling plus baking gets to 6 minutes per inch of thickness. You want to check early and often. You can always cook it more, but you can't uncook it. No. It's still completely stuck in the center. Let's give it another three minutes. Now we are good. I can pull the flakes apart in the thickest part, but the center is still translucent. As the salmon rests, it will continue to cook and will be perfect by the time we need it. Cool it for at least 20 minutes before using in the salad. Our veggies and salmon have cooled off and we are ready to assemble. Let's go back to our bowl with pickles and onions. My dressing contains mayo, Dijon mustard, lots of chopped dill, of course if you don't like it you can skip it, and lots of freshly ground black pepper. A word about mayo, I use Hellman's mayo, the full fat version, not the low fat type. You can use whatever mayo tastes good to you. Add the salmon, leaving the skin behind. I wanted to see what it would feel like with one piece of salmon. During the lean Soviet times, that's probably the amount of protein that Olivier would get. But since I already broke all the rules anyway, I decided to add the second piece of salmon as well. I like to give the fish and mayo a good mix before adding potatoes, so that the potatoes stay as intact as possible. Tap and roll the eggs and peel them in water. Cut into small dice and add to the salad along with potatoes, carrots and peas. Splash the potatoes generously with lemon juice and gently mix everything together. I use a sort of folding motion so that I don't damage the potatoes. Taste early on to see what else you need. I felt like I needed more black pepper. And now we can finish mixing everything together. This salad can be served immediately, but it's even better if you let it sit in the fridge for about an hour or overnight. Can I make it vegetarian? Absolutely. Just skip the salmon and reduce the mayo slightly. If you end up putting tofu into olivier, that's cool. I find the idea horrifying, but not because it's not authentic. Using diced bologna is very authentic as far as the Soviet Olivia goes, but equally horrifying to me. It's a holiday salad, and I feel that the protein should be something luxurious. Why don't you make your own mayo? Yes, I am perfectly capable of making my own mayo, but one of my children is allergic to raw eggs and the processing that Hellman's puts its mayo through makes it possible for him to eat it. Simply cooking my eggs sous vide to 140 degrees doesn't degenerate the protein enough. I'd have to figure out the time and temperature combination that would be sufficient and for what. I simply love souped up Hellman's. All it needs is a squirt of lemon, a balsamic vinegar, and thorough stirring to restore the creamy texture. Why don't you use canned peas? Many people from the former Soviet Union who grew up with Olivier feel strongly about using canned peas. During my childhood, it was a delicacy, but I find them overly sweet and mushy, unless it's a matter of nostalgia. Frozen peas are tremendously better than canned. Why do you use soy sauce, balsamic vinegar, and apricot preserve? I know these seem like ridiculous ingredients in Olivia, but once the salad is made, you would never be able to guess these ingredients, not in a million years. What's so distinctive about Olivia is that it's not just a potato salad, but a potato and meat salad. 
whether the meat is beef or chicken or duck or quail, they lend the salad a lot of umami, which is the fifth taste that we associate with savoriness. Using soy sauce with salmon gives it that flavor profile. Balsamic vinegar is there for balance, saltiness likes acidity, and the apricot preserve helps the salmon brown, which gives it a much more complex flavor profile. If you want, you can certainly poach your salmon or cook it sous vide or just bake it, but this glazed salmon is wicked good. If you like my completely unauthentic but perfectly delicious videos, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button. Happy New Year and I'll see you in 2023!